You know, I went on vacation for like one day, and this is what I come back to. Why? What'd you guys do? I just want a single day gone. And it's just like, oh, by the way, the, the <laughs> an unpatchable vulnerability. By the way, I'm curious what these encryption keys are. What? what I, I wonder which encryption keys we leak in. You know, like it sounds kind of exciting. I assume it's to be able to uh, unencrypt your drive. So you can just like look at everything. Classic backdoor. In other words, they just discovered the CIA backdoor. Backdoor, CIA. A newly discovered vulnerability baked into Apple's M series of chips allows attackers to extract secret keys from Macs when they perform widely used cryptography operations, academic researchers have revealed in a paper published Thursday. So, real question. Backdoor Wang mentioned this is a full backdoor Wang. When there's an unfixable problem like this, how long do you wait before you like publish out a paper? Like what's a what's like the rule of thumb? Like do you have to like go and talk to them? Is there like something you have to do? This was probably found day one after release. It probably was found. Uh, I think you have to get vendor approval. Okay, really, you have to get vendor approval. Why did why does Apple have to say you can release that? Responsible disclosure. Yeah, I mean, I assume there's some sort of a uh, conference requires 90 days. That's it. Okay, Apple got uh, owned in its own hardware. I know. You made custom hardware. Get effed. Well, uh, let's see. Oh, is is there a little bit of a Reddit one? Uh, today I learned uh, it's a side channel attack that requires some very specific set of events in a controlled environment to work over the course of minutes or hours. Threat. Average users, nothing to see here. High value targets. If your machine is seized and it's an M1 or M2, there is a chance this could be used to extract keys and decrypt data. There was one point he forgot. Do you guys know what that one point is? Average system 76 users don't even, don't even, what, what's that? What's an Apple M1 chip? Is that that company that's getting sued all the time for monopolies? Like, what's what's an Apple? Where's your stickers at? Oh, I'm an adult. I hate to, I hate to tell you this, but uh, as an adult, I don't put stickers on my laptop. I keep things clean and nice. Anyway, so let's find out more about this. A flaw, a side channel. So I don't know what a side channel is that. Is that like a side hustle or a side honey? In, in, in computer security, a side channel attack is any attack based on an extra information that can be gathered because of a fundamental way a computer protocol or algorithm is implemented, rather than flaws in the design of the protocol or algorithm itself. Okay, okay, so a side channel attack is effectively you're able to see how the algorithm works or the protocol, and you're able to abuse some something inside of it due to how it works. It's not a flaw in the protocol. It's a flaw in the implementation. Is that what it's saying? I can talk on this. Yeah, you want to, hey, low-level learner, why don't you jump on for a quick second and tell me about this. Call me on Discord. There we go. All right, all right. So, obviously, a quick, quick introduction about yourself. What do you do? Why, 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 why are you going to explain side channel hacking to me? Uh, yeah, so my name is Low Level Learning. I'm Ed. Hi. Uh, I'm a security researcher during the day. So my job is to, instead of writing code, like the rest of smart people on YouTube that are smarter than me, I look at code, I find bugs in code, and then I write reports. Uh, yeah, okay. so that's me. Yep. Okay, okay. So what's a side channel attack? Did I, did I describe this correctly? You did 100%, yeah. So, so basically, an easy way to think of a side channel attack is let's pretend we have a password checking algorithm. Uh, and the password checking algorithm will check every character of the password. And we know that if the password is correct for one character, that character will take one second to process. But if it takes three seconds to process, then it's incorrect. So oh, the amount of time yeah. that it takes is not a part of the actual protocol, but it's a different side channel that the algorithm reveals. And then so we know like, okay, if the first character took three seconds, it's wrong. We brute force that until it takes one second. And, and like that, that's an idea of a side channel. Okay, so, the Apple okay, so it's using... Thing. It's effectively using the implementation of this protocol algorithm, whatever, and being able to discover new information due to how it operates. Yeah, exactly. Something about its operation is incorrect, and so we can leak information out of it via a side channel. Mm. So, for, for example, and we're going to talk about this in this article, like a, a big bug that happens all the time in CPUs is cache side channeling, right? So, like when. Yeah, CPUs hit me with that. What is that? So a big bug back in the day was uh, called Spectre and Meltdown. So Spectre and Meltdown were bugs in what was called speculative execution. So when you run code in your CPU, your CPU is actually in the future. It's running code like five or six instructions ahead of where your PC is, your program counter. And what it's doing is it's trying to figure out, like it's trying to guess which branch you're going to take and execute prefetching on those branches. Um, and so what was happening is that you could actually leak data out of other memory based on uh, prefetching. And effectively the bug was that via that, that caching side channel, you could leak data out of any memory address on the CPU, including 
like outside of your process region into the kernel of your CPU mm. via a caching side channel, right? So, so caching and CPUs and modern CPUs are a huge area of uh, side channel vulnerabilities. Okay, and this is because they they are speculatively loading data that you may or may not need into these. Uh, what is this like? These okay. Shut up, battle. Okay, battle nets. Just letting me know. I may want to update something. Just oh, no, I don't. I actually don't want to. No, I actually don't want to. No, I literally. I'm pr I'm pressing no. It's like you must game right now, dude. I don't want to game. Okay, I'm not in the game zone right now. That was crazy. That was crazy. Just really tried to force it on me. Um, battle net side side channel attack. Okay. Yeah. So this is do, like so. Just so I kind of understand this, I assume this is involving like the L1 ca caching type layer of the of the memories that you're yeah. filling it up with potentially things you could use, and there's a way for you to feed instructions into the CPU and effectively just read from the speculative fetched area, and yeah, so you could actually just read any data. Like, yeah, it basically had to do with like the timing of if you took a branch that invoked a cache miss versus a cache hit because one is slower than the other. They're able yeah. to use that. And again, I don't know the details of it because it's literally black fucking magic. Um, it was able to use the timing of a branch that invoked a cache hit or a cache miss and able to use that to leak information out of literally any memory address. And it was only at like kilobits per second or bits per second, but it's still bits per second, right? It's still yeah. pri privileged memory that you don't have access to. Um, you only but, need to leak not you don't need to leak a whole bunch of information to be able to really screw yourself. Exactly. Yeah. And so it could leak, you know, process memory from another process, a privileged process, whatever. That was in 2016. That was a long time ago. But since then, that that bug, that report kind of broke ground on uh, people doing research into cache based or speculative execution based side channeling at CPUs. So I, I think this is where this article comes from, which I won't uh, spoil it. But there you go. All right. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Hey, man. Gotcha. Thank you, Triple L. Hell yeah, dude. Enjoy the article. Uh, my son actually just woke up, so I'm going to go take care of that. All right. Bye-bye. Later, bud. What a nice guy giving us a little bit of information there. Okay, okay. So we, we, we now feel more endowed, if you will, about what to do here. All right, so a flaw, let's see, a flaw, a side channel allowing end-to-end -end key extractions when Apple chips run implementations of a widely used cryptogra uh, cryptographic protocols can be patched, let's see, can't be patched directly because it stems from the micro-architectural design of the silicon itself. Damn, printed a side channel. <laughs> printed that flaw. Put, it, put, put that one in paper. Just believed in it so hard. That's crazy. I wonder, like, how bad that really is. Because obviously that the the you know I, I'm not a huge fan of just listening to whatever Reddit says and it just says the average person doesn't matter but like high value targets if you keep high value information on there there's a chance that somebody might be able to get your uh, encryption keys to your drive and then would be able to decrypt your drive pretty much correct it takes a lot of time I don't think times a, a times an issue at that point right. Yeah, they have to get physical access. They have to, like, steal your laptop. So if you were a high-value target with something very important on it, and some guy just walked up to you, punched you in the face, took your laptop, ran away, you'd have plenty of time once you're arrested. Then they could theoretically be able to take that. Skill issue? Pun punch in the face and grab. It's, it's one of the classic security problems. Falcor punch? <laughs> Dang it. Why do you guys keep talking about Falcor? Uh, instead, it can only be migrated, uh, uh, mitigated by building defenses into third-party cryptographic software that could drastically degrade M-series performance when executing cryptographic operations, particularly on the earlier M1 and M2 generations. The vulnerability can be exploited when the target cryptographic operation and the malicious application with normal user system privileges run on the same CPU cluster. Dang. Beware of hardware optimizations. Uh, the threat resides... And the chip's data memory dependent prefetcher. Oh, this is exactly what low level was talking about. This this speculative execution business. A hardware optimization that predicts the memory addresses of data that running code is likely to access in the near future. By loading the contents into the CPU cache before it's actually needed, the DMP, as the fu let's see, as the feature is abbreviated, reduces latency between the memory or the main memory and the CPU, a common bottleneck in modern computing. DMPs are a relatively new phenomenon found only in M series chips and Intel's 13th generation. Ah, Raptor Lake microarchitecture. By the way, that's like just the most badass name I've ever seen. Uh, Apple's like M series, Intel's like Raptor Lake. I mean, it sounds terrifying. A lake 
of raptors. Raptor Lake, Skull Canyon. I mean, they have ba- they have badass names. Uh, although older forms of prefetchers have been for common for years, security experts have long known that classical prefetchers open a side channel that malicious processes can probe to obtain secret key material from cryptographic operations. This, uh, I, I guess, that makes sense, right? Because if uh, for those that don't know, I know you could, you could, you know, it's a very common for people to encrypt their drive on a Mac. And so you have an encrypted drive. And so obviously these operations have to be running pretty frequently. And so my, my assumption is that it's just, it's just effectively probing for these type of decrypting operations to happen. And once they happen, they take advantage of that, right? So wherever the, you know, I don't know if they have to return, re, the Ansible encrypt, exactly. Effectively, if you could just know when Ansible encrypt happens and you could just sit there and just do it over and over again. Theoretically, you could you could get this. That's crazy. That's wild. This vulnerability is the result. Like, that is black magic level. It's encrypted by default. Okay, it's been a long time since I've touched a Mac. Okay, I haven't touched a Mac in, in eight years. I have no idea. Biggest problem here is cloud providers where multiple people share the same hardware and processor. I, well, this is on M1. I'm not really sure. I know that there does exist apples in the cloud. I now, I now see what you're saying. That's actually really interesting. Okay, so if you're doing like shared, so in other words, you, mm, okay, so these, these, shared, uh, these shared cloud $5 rentable computers, you have this chance to be able to start scraping other people's information. AWS only offers uh, M1 as a whole device, not a shared device. Okay. Is that like, I assume that's what you're trying. Don't share Max and AWS. It's all or nothing. Okay, so that's not even a, an issue. I know, I knew uh, what's it called AWS has Max. I've just never really Maced. You know what I mean? They evaporate M1 chips, uh, condense uh, them TP to uh, make a cloud. Okay. Okay, kind of like, uh, kind of like a uh, three body problem. Okay. Okay. I've heard about this. One apple, <laughs> one bad apple spoils the whole bunch. Exactly. They need physical access. Okay, so they need physical access. So there really isn't. So the clouds aren't a problem. Okay. Uh, the breakthrough of the new research is that it exposes a previously overlooked behavior in TMPs in Apple, Apple Silicon. Sometimes they confuse memory content, such as key material, with the pointer value that is used to load other data. As a result, the DMP often reads the data and attempts to treat it as an address to perform memory access. This dereferencing of pointers, uh, meaning the data of the let's see the reading of the data and leaking it through the side channel, is a flagrant violation of constant time paradigm. You know, I, I will say that it sounds like a dangling pointer problem, and it does make me feel a little bit, a little bit better that even even these even these chip writers ain't getting ain't getting them pointers correct sometimes. This is this. It sounds like a skill issue, honestly. This sounds like a skill issue. Are we having full skill issue at the CPU level? Damn. A team of researchers consists of. Uh, wow, this is an entire. This is like a company. It's a lot. Look at that. This is a lot of. Uh, this is a lot of uh, universities. Carnegie Mellon, Georgia Institute of Technology, JIT, <laughs> one of the best. Sixty nine four twenty on the skill issues. Yeah, dang. Reminds me of the meltdown issues uh, with Intel. <sighs> big names. Those are some big names. Thick names. Girthy names. In an email, they explain prefetchers usually look at addresses of access data, ignoring the values of access data, and try to guess future addresses that might be useful. The DMP is different in the sense as, in addition to addresses, it also uses the data values in order to make predictions. Ah, okay, so it's looking effectively at tr- a bunch of trues and falses, attempting to say, okay, we're going to take this branch or the next branch. In particular, if a data value looks like a pointer, it'll be treated as an address. I would really love to see the code that says looks like a pointer. Like I, I, I'm genuinely curious. What does looks like a pointer code? I gotta know. I got, I like, I have to know. It's just like, what is this thing? Ah, 64 bits of ones and zeros pointer mentioned. Everybody pointer mentioned. <laughs> it's like, I, I actually would have no idea how to tell if something's a pointer or not. If I were to write a pointer mentioned function, it would literally look like this. We're going to do it in Node, baby, because it's just right here. It'd be, it would be it would look something like a function is pointer, and it'd just be a value, and I would just go return true. <laughs> I don't know. Yo, you hand me 64 bits of something. That's kind of a pointer, wouldn't you say? <laughs> One could say this is a pointer. <laughs> NPM package now. If pointer equals true, probably a pointer. First try. Yeah, if it does not equal zero, it's probably a pointer. 
else it's the nil pointer, which is a pointer. It's a pointer. <laughs> Just like, dang it. Does it equal zero or does it not equal zero? Next one. Constant time paradigm is not va validated. Ex exactly. Why does your stream have a VTuber tag? Uh, are you just a bunch of pointers? I am. Don't judge my pixels. Okay. You can't come in here judging my pixels. Uh, where, uh, in fact, it's actually not. The data from this address will be brought to the cache. The arrival of this address into the cache is visible, leaking over cache side channels. Oh. So it's able to bamboozle the is pointer function into thinking that the data is a pointer and then thus load it into cache where it's visible. And then someone has to be reading this cache. I, you know, obviously not, not, I mean, way out of my, way out of my, my, my league here, but you must be able to read the cache somehow. Crazy. Our attack exploits this fact. We cannot leak encryption keys directly, but we can. Uh, but we can do is manipulate intermediate data inside the encryption algorithm to look like a pointer via a chosen input attack. The DMP then sees the data value uh, looks like an address and brings the data from this address into the cache, which leaks the address. We don't care about the data value being prefetched, but the fact that the intermediate data looked like an address is visible via a cache channel is sufficient to reveal the secret key over time. <laughs> it makes zero sense. I'm sure. I'm sure this actually makes a ton of sense. I think this only doesn't make sense to uh, to, to layman's such as us. Okay, I've only been programming for for like 20 years. I can't understand this kind of stuff. Okay, I'm too dumb. Like I get the I get the basic principle. I'm sure the is pointer function is probably a little bit more sophisticated. I'm sure they have like a lot of like value and I'm sure something that looks like, you know, it can't have a 1 in the 33 spot, right? And it, it, by the way, this would this wouldn't work for JavaScript. So just ignore it. Because remember, anytime you do a bit operation, it, it casts it to a 32-bit signed number, so this would just be like 2. But I'm sure it does some sort of checking where it's just like, "Hey, how big is this number? Do we have a bunch of zeros on one end? That's my guess. This article proves that security is boring. Security is slow and boring, and it's hard. But some people love it. Uh, our key insight is that while the DMP only dereferences pointers, an attack can craft program inputs so that when those inputs mix with cryptographic secrets, the resulting intermediate state can be engineered to look like a pointer if and only if the secret satisfies an attacker-chosen predicate. For example, imagine that a program has secret S, takes X as an input, and computes and then stores Y equals S XOR uh, X uh, and it's, uh, it to its program memory. The attacker can craft different X's to infer partial or even complete information about S. Ooh. Oh, dang, that's so dang clever. So XOR, specifically XOR has memory. So for those that don't know about this, this is this is super cool. This is super cool. Check this out. For those that don't know, this is like an old graphics card trick. If I go like this, const A equals, uh, let's create a, a decimal, let's create a, a very special number here. I'm going to go like this. Let A equals um, binary 100100, okay? And then I'm going to create B which is 001110, okay? All right, now watch this one. A equals A, B. B equals A, uh, B. A equals A, B. And now watch this one. Are you ready for this one? Battle.net, no! I don't want it! Battle.net, shut up! No! 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 What the hell is wrong with you, Battle.net? All right, anyways, check this out. Watch this. A, two, string, and I, let's see, hold on. How, how, what's the way to print it out with binary? I, th I swear uh, two string works uh, with a number. Is that right? Can I just provide a two? Look at, what, look at what I just printed for A. What do you see about A? That's unique. What do you see about B? That's unique. Yeah, for a lot of people that don't know what just happened there, notice the value of A is 100100. Now it's 1110, which is B, and A, and now B is A. So for those that don't know, this is called an XOR swap. And the reason why that happens is that XOR has memory. Dude, it's, it's, this is like one of my favorite, one of my just like favorite little things about numbers in, 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 the, in the old computer science land is that, okay, so check this out. The reason how this works is that for those that don't know how XOR works, here's the truth table. Let's say we have A, B, and we go 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. The truth table to this would be 0, 1, 1, 0. So only when they're different is it true. So that means 
that it has memory. So when if A equals 1 and B equals 0, if I went A equals 1 XOR 0, that means A will remain as a 1. And B, if I do it again, now I go B equals 1 XOR 0. Notice that B becomes 1. A is 1, B is 1. Now if I do it one more time, A, which is 1, XOR, oh, I'm in the way now, 1, notice what A is. What is 1, 1? A is now 0. It flopped. It's super cool. XOR is just absolutely fantastic. XOR is one of the coolest things. And so there's so many cool things you can do with XOR. That's why like one time on stream, we built a linked list in C uh, only using XOR for being able to do all the uh, linked list operations. And the reason why you could do that is that a pointer is just a number, right? Datas are just numbers. So if you take a data region and XOR each other, what are you going to get? you're going to get you're going to flop them right and so i was able to do all the uh, operations on a linked list just using a bunch of xors it's super fun nand is better nand is even better okay very neat the attacker can craft a different accent and infer partial or even complete information about us by observing whether the dmp is able to dereference y very interesting the first use of this observation to break the guarantees of the standard constant time swap primitive recommended for the use in cryptographic implementations we uh, then show how to break complete cryptographic implementations designed to be secure against chosen input attacks. Interesting. Enter GoFetch. The attack, which researchers have named GoFetch, uses an application that doesn't require root access, only the same user privileges needed by most third-party applications installed on macOS system. M-series chips are divided into what is known as clusters. The M1, for example, is two clusters, one containing four efficient uh, efficiency cores and the other four performance cores. As long as GoFetch app and the targeted cryptographic app are running on the same uh performance cluster even when on separate cores within that cluster gofetch can mine enough secrets to leak a secret key the attack works against both classical encryption algorithms and newer generation of uh, encryption that has been hardened to withstand anticipated attacks from quantum computers the gofetch app requires less than an hour to extract the 248-bit rsa key and a little over two hours to extract the 248 uh, diffie hellman key the attack takes 54 minutes to extract the material required to assemble a Kyber 512 key and about 10 hours for the Dilithium 2 key, not counting offline time needed to process the raw data. <sighs> That's wild. That's so cool. You know, like this stuff is like really, really intense and really, really hard to do. To me, this is where I think things like, you know, where now that you have this, like you have the ability to kind of seed an AI to do it, like, what can the AI do with this kind of information? To me, that, that, that seems like a pretty neat... I mean, when I say neat, I mean it seems very interesting. I'm curious if it could actually do something interesting. Because it is... Well, it's smarter than me, right? Nothing? I think it could do something, right? If you gave it all the ability to do something, how cool can it do? Right? I don't know, but that's still pretty neat. I like these kind of things. Anything that requires a bunch of very sophisticated steps to be able to produce something, I'm always very curious to see what is it going to look like in 10 years as we make as we make things more AI driven. Are, are people, are, are we just gonna have a massive data breaches everywhere? Who knows what's gonna happen? Very excited. I don't know, I love this stuff. This stuff is so cool. I'm, I, I don't want to actually like learn about it. The funny part is I like it in the sense that I don't want to actually learn about it. I just want to learn about it a little bit. Quantum computing is gonna get scary. Well, quantum computing is terrifying. Like if we actually have any sort of real quantum computing at like some real level, not like some fake level, right? Um, but like real level, man, that's gonna be wild. Like when we have uh, logical bits as opposed to uh, physical ones, whew, that's gonna get wild. All right, um, so this is pretty cool. This is super cool. Uh, GoFetch isn't the first time researchers have identified threats lurking in Apple DMPs. The optimization was first documented in 2022 research that discovered a previously known pointer chasing DMP in both M1 and Apple's A14 Bionic chips for uh, iPhones. The research from a different assemblage of an academics gave rise to the augury, augury, an attack that identified and exploited a memory side channel and leaked pointers. Ultimately, augury was unable to mix data and addresses when constant time practices were used, a shortcoming that may have been given the impression the DMP didn't pose much of a threat. Dang. Super cool, though. Super cool.
All right. Like uh, other uh, micro, micro architecture CPU side channels, the one that makes GoFetch possible can't be patched in the silicon. Instead, responsibility for uh, mitigating the harmful effects of the vulnerabilities falls on the people developing code for Apple hardware. For developers, a cryptographic software running on an M1 and M2 processors, this is me- uh, this means that in addition to constant time programming, they will have to employ other defenses, almost all of which come with significant performance penalties. Dang, all that speed up just to get destroyed. That's going to be sad if you guys get destroyed due to that. So you're telling me GoFetch can't uh, be made possible? No, it's the other way around. GoFetch can has to be defensively programmed against it it's the it's the it's the inverse is that you have to you cannot fix the silicon it's by design therefore you have to now have defensive coding in highly perf- uh, performance sensitive stuff which means that you're going to just absolutely destroy uh just absolutely destroy like performance time All right uh, apple keynote m4 is 50 percent faster than m3 as long as you don't use any software <laughs> It's the fastest CPU you've ever seen as long as you do nothing. It will be faster than anything ever. Uh, all right. Like other microarchitecture CPU side channels, uh, the one that makes uh, GoFetch possible can't be patched in silicon. Instead, responsibility for mitigating the harmful effect vulnerabilities falls on the people developing code. I think we already talked about this. Um, for developers, the cryptographic software on M1 and M2 processor, this means in addition to constant time programming, they'll have to employ other defenses. Oh, I already did read this. One of the most... Uh, effective mitigations known as the ciphertext blinding is a good example. Blinding works by adding or removing masks to sensitive values before slash after being stored to loaded uh, uh, stored to slash loaded from memory. This effectively randomizes the internal state of cryptographic algorithms, preventing an attacker from controlling it and thus neutralizing GoFetch attacks. Unfortunately, the researcher said this defense is both algorithmic algor- algorithmic specific and often costly potentially even doubling the computer's resources needed in some cases, such as for the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. (sighs) Dang. This is super cool. Uh, One uh, one other defense to run cryptographic processes on previously mentioned efficiency cores, also known as uh, ice storm cores. Ice storm! Hell yeah, brother. Hell yeah, brother. Man, ice storm... Ice Storm sounds like a name from from World of Warcraft. These people are badass. You, dude, Gore Lord and Ice Storm coming right at you. Uh, which doesn't have DMP. One approach is to run all cryptographic code on these cores. This defense too is hardly ideal. Not only is it possible for unannounced changes to the DMP functionality to efficiency cores, running cryptographic processes here will likely increase the time required to complete operations by a non-trivial margin. The researchers mentioned several ad hoc defenses, but they are equally problematic. The DMP on the app, the M3, Apple's latest chip, has a special bit that developers can invoke to disable the feature. The researchers don't know yet what kind of penalty will occur when performance optimization is turned off. Oh, interesting. Okay, so there is, like, some defense here. Then, I cast an ice storm. Readers uh, should remember that whenever penalties result uh, will only be felt when affected software is performing a specific cryptographic operations. For browsers and many other types of apps, the performance cost may not even be noticeable. Okay. Longer, longer term, we view the right situation to broaden the hardware software contract account for the DMP. The researchers wrote, at a minimum, hardware should expose so- uh, to software a way to selectively disable the DMP when running security critical applications. This already has a nascent industry precedent. The examples uh, Intel's Do It extension specifically mentioned disabling their DMP through an ISA extension. Longer term, we want ideally. Okay, I mean this makes sense, right? You should be able to just turn it off for very specific operations. Yeah, you hit a you hit a performance penalty, but you can't leak special keys. Seems pretty. It seems pretty reasonable. Seems it seems pretty reasonable, right? All right. Um. Hey, great, great article. This is a great article. They'll just find another side channel. Of course, they'll find another side side channel. But it's still very, very interesting. Ice storm. Microsoft a threat actor naming. Microsoft often puts a new naming taxonomy uh, for threat actors aligned with the theme of the weather. We intend to bring better clarity to customers and other security researchers with new taxonomy. We offer more organized, articulated, and easy way to reference the uh, threat actors so that organizations can better prioritize and protect themselves against and aid security researchers already confronted with an overwhelming amount of threat intelligence data. North Korea. Sleet. (laughs) Sleet. The shittiest of all weathers, referred to as North Korea. All right, so which one's ice? 
So Storm is a group uh, uh, groups in development. All right, where's Ice? Ice isn't listed. So Ice isn't listed. So it's 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 something group uh, groups in development. Ice Storm. Dusty Tsunami. <laughs> Imagine getting hit with a dust tsunami. Like right now, like that would be just so bad. I don't want. I don't want to get hit with a dust tsunami. Ice is probably NSA. Yeah, it's probably NSA. Does that mean when you have multiple countries working together, you can have a blizzard sandstorm tempest? This is a blizzard typhoon tempest sandstorm sleet. It's slightly dusty. Poor Vietnam. How did Vietnam get in there? Anyways, this is basically spellcasting. You've basically become a spellcaster. All right. Well, hey, fa- fantastic. Everything, every uh, everything snow cone, yeah. The everything snow cone, cyclone, blizzard storm, <laughs> sharknado. No, the answer is no. It's not. It's not going on there. Hey, thank you by the way, Primogen Waifu. Appreciate that. Hey, the name is man. This stuff is interesting and probably slightly over my head. Secret to avoiding the M1 problem: don't own an Apple. A uh, Jen. <laughs> 